Hello and welcome back to another episode of You Want to Do What with Dan and Julie. Today we've got Steve Woods on, who is a photographer based in Canada. Hi Steve, how are you? Hey, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Good, good. So do you want to tell everyone a little bit about what you actually do, Steve? Yeah, um, okay. So um, so I'm a photographer, um, obviously from the UK. You can uh, probably hear a bit of brummy in my accent maybe somewhere. I could, I could. <laughs> <laughs> Which is obviously not surrounded by water. So uh, yeah, um, I'm, a, I'm a photographer. I uh, started out working with the uh, Birmingham Post and Mail um, and, uh, and then started to kind of work in sports and uh, press, uh, press photography back in the UK for national newspapers. Um, after uh, after doing that like i really kind of just got interested in trying to like affect a change kind of make a change in the world trying to use the photography to make a difference really you know to try and kind of use it as a positive force um i've ended up now um living in canada and working as a i guess a conservation photographer really um, trying to use the kind of images that we take from different locations around the world in order to highlight different um, causes and different problems so that people can kind of um, look and understand and we can raise awareness to so we can change issues there's a wow. there's a in the middle as well <laughs> <laughs> so where did this um, love of photography come from I guess to start with I get asked this quite a lot but I guess to start with um, my parents lived in Kathmandu for a number of years and wow. uh, one of my sisters was born there and another grew up there and um, where I was actually born in London after they returned, but we went back there. Um, I think I was about 13 or 14 years old. And, you know, around that kind of time, um, you really just as a kid just want to play with, you know, gadgets and toys and so on like this. And my dad had a, had an SLR camera and it was the only kind of electronic thing that was, uh, that was around at the time. And so I just, I was just fascinated by it. And I just was fascinated by the, location you know we were kind of trekking around Nepal and uh, and so to be able to kind of have it and record memories it was everything for me um, I was also a, a huge skateboarder when I was uh, when I was younger and as much as I can nowadays if possible and so to be able to kind of record and hold those pictures was uh, a great way to just kind of learn about the world really yeah did you uh do you study photography anywhere or was it your um, sort of thing? I didn't to start with, no. Um I just played around and I love photography and then I was kind of very much self-taught. Um I've done so many different jobs over my career. You know, I've sold credit cards, I've worked in bars, I've been a chef, I, I did so much stuff when I was a kid, um, just kind of looking for a calling, really, I guess. And so then once I found photography and I started to get into it I think I was about 23 or 24 and I did a uh, HND in photography I think I kind of largely used that just to be able to get a student loan so I could buy more equipment um, <laughs> you know <laughs> and then just go off and take pictures um, and but then straight after that I went and did a master's uh, in photography wow um, uh, yeah it was it was it was really really interesting because it was it was self uh you know kind of self led really and so i i basically just kind of studied conflict photography um because i wa at the same time i was working as a, a press photographer and a sports photographer and i at that point really thought that i wanted to go into conflict photography um again just trying to help someone just trying to help someone with the you know the skills that i had you know um, so I hadn't had never kind of um, trained through it with a, um, with a with a college. Obviously, you have a, a, the skills to take a, a picture. But obviously, talking about different types of stuff you actually capture, do you have to have different skills and mindsets to be able to do those different jobs? Hundred percent. Yeah. I mean. I think really my kind of main formal education with photography was working for the newspapers because you have to do such a range of photography and it's so pressurized, you know, you have to have the pictures back on the picture desk, you know, hours ago, you know, you're always competing with someone and you might be thrown from a football pitch 
straight into, you know, uh, uh, a double murder or, you know, taking pictures of a prime minister or something within the same day, you know, so it, it ranges so, so differently. You have to pick up those skills. I think that really the art of kind of photography is that once you've built up those skills, you then start to kind of learn how to actually operate yourself as a person, you know? I think that's the kind of most important part is to then be able to um, feel comfortable in all of those different situations and then just kind of bring out the, the technical skill when you need it for the, for the kind of different situations. Would you suggest to young uh, photographers wanting to get into, the, uh, get into a career that working for a newspaper would probably be best to be able to learn the many different types of skills out there? I think, again, it's, it's something that I, it's a tricky one and something that I think about all the time and, and get asked quite a lot. I think firstly, you know, anything that I would say to anyone, you know, young or old budding to kind of get into photography and, and uh, as a career, um, firstly would just be, don't give up, you know, you have to be tenacious like you would just have to constantly be out there taking photographs and you need to do it because you want to do it. If you ever kind of, you know, give up or anything like this, you're just never going to make it. And the other thing is, is if you ever listen to anyone saying like, Oh, you're never going to make it. You're never going to do it. That's never going to make it for you as well. You have to just believe in yourself that you can do it because you can do it, you know, I find that in these incredibly competitive um, arenas, actually it develops really good practice. So getting out there, looking and learning and practicing your skill is the way to get into it. It's not really about gaining likes on social media. You know, unfortunately, yes, this does help. But if you're kind of too worried about that, you're never going to get anywhere. What you need to do is go off and hone your craft, really get to look and understand your craft by looking at books, looking at other photographers, studying what they do, thinking about how they think, you know, and really kind of getting granular into, um, into those ideas in order to then emerge as the kind of fully formed photographer later. I mean, speaking of uh, competitive spaces, being in Canada, you're surrounded by some amazing photographers. I mean, a lot of the photographers I follow and uh, are so, have big social medias um, are based in Canada. Yeah, it's, it's really been wonderful, actually. Um, it's taken me a while to get to Canada. Before Canada, I was in uh, Indonesia for four or five years, and I was in Norway for, for the same kind of four or five years. And then I've just moved to Canada like last year. I kind of all of my the last kind of decade plus um, wherever I've been there's not really been that kind of many uh, good photographers hanging around there's not been like a huge community so it's really been quite a kind of solitary thing for me as soon as I got to Canada I realized like you said that like so many of these amazing photographers are based in Vancouver or in Canada you know, I mean, largely they're, they're always traveling, but they came from Canada and, you know, so they've always got a base here. And it's been one of the most amazing things to be here and actually link up with all of these people. Uh, you know, a couple of them had kind of thrown messages out to me on uh, social media just saying, oh, you know, look, you're in Vancouver, let's hang out. And it would just been wonderful to be able to chat with them, hang out with them, collaborate with them. You know, I think the main thing about uh, creativity uh, to really kind of push things forward is collaboration, you know, is to meet up with these people. A lot of people think that, oh, you know, you don't want to be in the same place as anyone else who's better than you or as good as you or anything like that, because it might kind of eclipse your own work. But mm -hmm. actually, I, I, I really disagree with that. Um, for us as photographers, there's nothing better than all coming together and heading out to go and shoot a certain project whether that be animals or portraits or landscapes, if you all come together and collaborate, it means that you learn kind of exponentially throughout their ideas and their viewfinders and just chatting and learning. And it's, it's a, it's a great process. So yeah, I think it can be kind of daunting all of these amazing Canadian photographers, but 
they're, they're all great people and they're so young as well. It's amazing. <laughs> I, I guess the reason I ask is about, I guess about a year ago, I got my first yeah. um, sort of like mirrorless camera because I was watching people like um, Peter McKinnon and, and Chris yeah. Howe on uh, YouTube. And like you say, there looks like it's just a load of photographers going around, having a, a great time together, taking amazing photos. I'd, I'd love to go to Canada one day. It looks stunning as well. You know, the, the scenery to take photos of. Totally. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. It, it really is like you find these kind of pockets, these social pockets of groups that go out and just kind of take pictures together. You know, it's a really good community that, again, whether it's just my experience or whether it was when I was growing up in the UK or what, well, I'm not sure, but I never really found that kind of community with photography there. You know, there was a couple of pockets of photographers that were kind of hanging out together but I never found that like really kind of creative uh, you know kind of hub that we find in uh, in Vancouver and maybe it's the landscape around here I don't know but it's it's a great place to be hey you should come out anytime please come out it's a, we, we will take you up on that <laughs> got, make, make sure to do that I've got a uh, I've got a really good friend over here um, a guy called Emmett Sparling um, mm-hmm. was one of the guys who kind of reached out to me originally um, and he, just around him revolves this kind of hub of uh, creativity. He started a, um, um, a company called Triplet uh, with his mom, actually, um, which kind of connects creative photographers with social media influences and so on like that with people in the industry. Um, and so I've been to a couple of the kind of events and it's so wonderful to just bring people together share ideas and move forward and and I think if anything like this is to go back to your kind of previous question this is one thing that I would say to any you know young or old budding new photographers who want to kind of you know get better or just get stoked about the kind of creativity is you know find other people around you and link up with them and chat to them and you know it doesn't matter you know about kind of this you know that when you're at school making friends it's a nervous thing like as photographers, we always want to talk about things together and, you know, get kind of granularly interested about uh, cameras and photos and techniques and so on. So I would say just go out and meet other people, go out and meet them on social media, the other the other photographers, and because uh, uh, it can really push you forward very quickly. Yeah. Well, the industry, is it is it, um, is it typical to have like a mentor or is it more just like a, a peer review community? I think that's a really that's a really interesting question. Um, I would a hundred percent yes. It kind of works in a very uh, non regulated kind of organic way in a kind of mentorship way. Yeah, like when I first was a um, a press photographer, um, I had a mentor. You, you know, the picture editor uh, there, the guy called a guy called Adam Fragley, one of the best you know press photographers in the UK based in the Midlands, just a fantastic guy, you know, and he really believed in me as a person, as a photographer. And all throughout my career, he's always kind of just helped me along, you know, and he always used to say to me, he used to say, Woodsy, you know, like, when, as you go up, be good to people because you're going to see them on the way back down. And I really (laughs) believe that, you know. Um, Over the years, meeting other photographers, um, another kind of, I guess, mentor of mine, a guy called George Carbus. We met on a, on a job years ago and, uh, again, connected with him. And we were just friends, you know, but he kind of that mentorship in terms of, you know, it's not a kind of, uh, um, you know, like a, an official mentorship, but just as friends, you kind of look and learn and chat and, and help each other. So, yeah, definitely there's a kind of a, a mentorship. And, I, and the other thing I would say to other photographers, like, take other people under your wing, you know? Um, I think it's so important for all of us to nurture our community because it's what keeps us alive. I, I do get very disheartened sometimes when I see photographers who, you know, on their, uh, in social media followings, Instagram say, you know, who don't have, who they, they don't follow anyone. You know, it always disheartens me because that just doesn't foster any kind of sense of community and support for each other. So, yeah. Mm. So how did you actually get started in your first photography job? What was the kind of process of actually getting in there and and getting your first job? (laughs) 
there's a kind of, it, I, I've, I've changed career within photography so many times. I think there's a kind of couple of funny, funny stories with all of them, really. <laughs> uh, when, uh, at, the, at the time, I was actually working, uh, doing motorway maintenance uh, with some friends. And I really wanted to, you know, I was getting better as a photographer. Um, and, um, and I saw this potentially as a, you know, as a job. And I thought to myself, well, you know, look, if I can, if I can be, you know, working on the motorways with these big, huge, you know, uh, uh, my friends who are big, huge guys working on the motorways, if I can do that, then I can do anything, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I had some friends at the time who ran a Tony and Guy salon, an essential salon. Um, and um, I just said to them, yeah, you know, look, I can shoot all of your uh, ad campaigns. So probably a little bit <laughs> ambitious at the time, <laughs> but, um, but they said, yeah, you know, look, why not? And so I started to kind of shoot pictures for them and, and their, uh, and their uh, sort of stylist and so on. So I get, so, so I think that is from connections. And this has been a theme throughout my whole life and career, like connections and contacts is always the way to go. Generally, if you know people, you can know their friends, you know their you know, other kind of contacts, and you're gonna, just as a kind of funnel, get work from that. Um, another, uh, when I started to work for newspapers, again, had that kind of tenacity of, like, I wanted to work for the newspaper. I had to get into that newspaper, and there was only one way to do it. You know, I'd phoned up, I'd emailed, and constantly didn't get any responses or anything like that. I went down into Birmingham and sat inside the uh, uh, reception kind of waiting area and I just said, you know, look, what is the picture editor's name? Um, I need to speak to the picture editor. And they were like, oh, they're busy, they're busy. I say, okay, no, no, no problem, I'm just going to wait. I'll sit and wait here until they come out, until they're free. And I can't remember how long I waited. It feels like it was a long time, maybe it wasn't that long, but <laughs> it, 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 romantically in my mind it was like, you know, hours and hours I was waiting there. Um, and then all of a sudden they just, you know, ended up giving me the email address of the guy that I needed to speak to. So, you know, going somewhere and hounding people, spending the time just to make sure that you can get in there, you know, kind of always works. You, you make such a great point. I mean, we're lucky enough that we get to speak to um, loads of amazing, successful people in their respective fields. I but bet, all yeah. of them have taken it upon themselves and actually taken the opportunity. They haven't just sat there and waited for them to come to them. They've gone out and actually said, okay, this is what I want to do. How am I actually going to do it? Totally. I mean, you know, look at the end of the day, whatever your field, whatever your craft, there's always going to be someone out there who's, you know, better than you, more well-placed, better contacts, you know, just better in all, all, all the way around. That can't deter you. You know, that can't deter you. I really think the only way to do it is just be tenacious and go out and take that opportunity, make that opportunity. You know, if you don't go out and actually just make it happen, it's never going to happen. No one's ever going to give it to you. And, you know, I think the, the kind of one fallacy that, that a lot of people kind of think is that when you look at other, um, you know, uh, big photographers or big people in whatever creative industry that you're kind of working in, you think, oh, they've just got it made. They've got it set. They haven't, you know. They are constantly out there hustling, grinding, thinking about the next opportunity. Even at the kind of top of their career, they're still having to do that. Um, luckily enough, um, uh, we, um, as I moved here and work in, uh, in Canada, you know, it's such a great place for photographers. Um, uh, Paul Nicklin lives here. Um, and his, uh, his partner, Christina Mittermeier, who are just, you know, absolutely huge in the kind of conservation and photographic, uh, their Instagrams are immense, aren't they? Oh, they're huge. Ab ab absolutely huge. You know, it's, it's, it's amazing. Paul, you know, again, both of them are very good friends and, you know, we go camping and we shoot projects together and, Actually, I just took Paul on a big um, uh, uh, coastal wolf project that we were shooting uh, oh, wow. at the Outer Islands of uh, Canada. Yeah, and, you know, I hung out with him a bunch. And, you know, it was really interesting to kind of gain an insight from, you know, ostensibly the kind of top, uh, certainly the top underwater and on land nature photographer for National Geographic over the last kind of, you know, 30 years, you know. Mm. Um, and uh, and still yet now, you know, Paul, like, is constantly, you know, just his appetite for the kind of hustle 
if you want to call it, is, you know, it's, it's insatiable, you know. And so to kind of see that and look and learn from that, you know, is just, uh, just really interesting. So, you know, never ever think that the hustle is finished. You always have to keep at it, go out there, you know, and kind of go and do it. But I guess the thing, thing you, that you do is as you, as a kind of new photographer, that's a very uncomfortable feeling trying to put yourself out there. Mm. Um, you just get used to it more and more and more, you know, you can have the best picture in the world. If no one sees it, it doesn't matter. You know, you can have the worst picture in the world. If everyone sees it, it becomes the most valuable picture, you know? So it's just about getting your work out there. Speaking about uh, Instagrams, obviously we found you through Instagram and it is so nice to just look through Instagram with the amazing photos on there. Um, <laughs> and you've, you've done some immense trips. Um, but what is an average day for you like as a photographer? <laughs> Sitting on the computer. <laughs> <laughs> Editing. <laughs> no, um, I mean, thanks so much for, you know, for looking at the, the, the Instagram and so on. And, you know, it's, it's really tricky because... But again, I was just talking with Paul recently and, uh, you know, about his kind of, you know, movement through photography. And unfortunately, all of those kind of avenues are closed off now. Instagram and social media really are the kind of um, uh, a really important part of that process now, which which weren't before at all, you know, in, in kind of Paul's era. Um, it's difficult because firstly, it... it you really have to be careful in terms of how you feel about it. And I have such a love hate relationship with it. You know, Um, you constantly have to be on there updating things, posting things. And this, this can be difficult. You constantly self, you know, uh, evaluating and that can be a a really negative thing really sometimes. So Mm. I think it's really important to, you know, kind of have this idea of specifically Instagram of one as an incredibly important and valuable tool, not just for you, but also as a kind of inspirational, creative tool, you know, like I've actually just cleaned off all of my kind of Instagram feeds. So it's specifically just uh, creative influences and creative ideas that I just really enjoy looking at, you know? Um, But the other thing is, is that you have to maintain a safe distance from it and not get too kind of caught up in the kind of, the disease that's the, the kind yeah, of self, you know, the self, uh, um, you know, analytical, it can get, it can get really difficult sometimes, you know, and, and can get quite dark. So it's important to get, you know, really kind of get that kind of distance from it. Um, going back to, you know, kind of, uh, uh, what does that look like as an average day? Like, you know, it really does, you know, like, I guess that's why I love it so much. Like an, an average day is so difficult to kind of equate over the you know time because sometimes like when we're, let's say, for instance, uh, one of the last big projects uh, we've just been working on was the coastal walls. Um, you know, the, the average day there was, you know, we were up at 4 a.m. Um, it was absolutely Piercing rain every single day. Um, <laughs> Sounds there. like so, England. Yeah. Exactly. Hey, I tell you what, I've never been to a place that rains more than England. <laughs> Trust me, it's unbelievable. Um, so, you know, we would get up at 4 a.m. Uh, we were camping on the beach, incessant rain. We would try and get all of that gear together inside the tent, soaking wet, covered in sand, which is the one kind of thing that I've had. Uh, absolute aversion to as a photographer is sand <laughs> um, you know and then we trek out to a location on in the middle of night so as silent as we can to try and get there like the wolves know that we're there we're trying to get there into our hides we built hides on the beach we're trying to get in there as quiet as possible so we're just not causing too much um, um you know kind of um too much noise or anything like that then we sit there for 17 hours 17 um, hours 17 hours all day long through the dawn through the morning mid-morning lunchtime post lunchtime early afternoon afternoon late afternoon early evening you, you kind of you, you forget how many different time <laughs> pieces of time there are in the day <laughs> um and we just sat there waiting for walls to come along um so that can be interesting, you know. I always say, like, 
you know, people say, oh, you know, you must have, you must be really hard to kind of just spend the time doing that. If, if you don't like sitting there in nature and just watching everything, this isn't the job for you, you know. Um, it, I just absolutely love it to sit there and watch the dawn and all the birds, the change in light, the, just really kind of feel the nature. It's wonderful, even if there aren't any wolves. Um, then after that, once the sun sets, we head back to the camp, have a uh, have some food, maybe a uh, maybe a wee dram, and then uh, get back to bed, and then do the same the next day. Um, so it's like that for a few weeks at a time, and then when we come home, it's you know cleaning kit, it's going through all the cameras, it's you know incessant editing, you know, and now the cameras that we're using shoot such high resolutions of pictures and videos a lot of the time it's waiting for things to upload waiting for things to download and then you know sending emails out you know going back to the kind of the hustle that I was talking about you know you have to get your work out there sometimes you're going to be shooting it for a project sometimes you're going to be shooting it on a kind of speculative basis but then you've got to get your work out there again no one new pictures don't matter if no one sees them so you've got to be getting the pictures out there talking to people you know, collaborating with people. Um, so, you know, it just can be so varied about how it, how it kind of all goes. Whenever I'm, whenever I'm based in, uh, I'm actually based in the city now, which is nice. I've been based in the city for a kind of decade. Um, being based in the city means that on my kind of off times, you know, I get to be trained. So I swim every day. I go to the gym every day or three three or four times a week and I, you know, go spinning every day, like in order to keep your kind of physical health as, you know, to the peak. So that not only for obviously later on in life, but when you're um, on assignment or you're doing a job, it can be really taxing, you know, having to look yeah. yeah, everything like that. So, so then you know that you're just kind of capable of doing things, you know? So, yeah. So, oh. Yeah, a lot goes into being a photographer that sounds like particularly a nature photographer but what sort of personality traits then do you see in yourself and some of the um so some of the other professionals around you that help you thrive in that industry um i think or patience I would, I, I, <laughs> sitting yeah, in a I, pen I, for 17 hours patience yeah patience or a kind of an absolutely kind of insane fascination with the natural world, I think maybe. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think you kind of have to just be an experienced junkie. Um, so what a friend of mine was, was kind of describing it as an experienced junkie, you know, so to be able to, you know, sit there and in nature and watch it happen to be there is everything. And so I think if you're kind of, you know, not absolutely fascinated by that, it, you know, it's never going to work for you. Um, all of the the people that I know, the photographers, we just get so, again, I don't know if this is the right way, the wrong way, who knows, whatever, but we get so passionate about the, you know, just the natural world, whether they're, you know, um, uh, Braden, you know, who's a, you know, kind of travel landscape photographer or Paul, who's a wildlife conservation photographer, you know, so many different um, photographers, like we all just get very passionate about the kind of world that we live in. And I think that's the thing. It's, it's being passionate and enthusiastic. It's being fiercely tenacious because really phot photographic careers are just built on innumerable setbacks, constant setbacks of, you know, not having the money for gear, not having your pictures out there, not getting that assignment, not winning that award, you know, constant failure. Um, uh, and then also a, a kind of, I think you need a, a healthy dose of, uh, uh, of um, self-deprecation, you know. If you can't sort of bring yourself back down to ground, then it's, it's never going to work with you. So, yeah, and a good sense of humour. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I guess this will be quite a difficult one to answer because I'm sure there are tons, but what are some of the biggest positives and the best opportunities you've got out of this career? Oh yeah. Like, uh, it's again, it's, it's such a dichotomy, isn't it? Because just in the last breath, I say, you know, look, photographic careers are largely based on innumerable failures at the same time, every single 
thing that you do every single time you do something is is you know largely a kind of little success as well so being able to connect with people or being able to just work out and play with new equipment or being able to go to different parts of the world and witness different things all of these things have just been so wonderful um you know and memories to to kind of keep with the photographs that you take it's so difficult to nail down um you know which are the kind of most wonderful you know kind of positives around it i think if i was to kind of just say like i don't know a kind of top two or three or something like firstly i think the reason why i gravitated towards photography um and photographs on our own to start with was because i wanted to hold on to a memory you know like i wanted to hold on to that thing that I did or that thing that I saw someone else do or that thing that I witnessed. And I just want to hold it because I was there, I experienced it and it was amazing. So I think that's the kind of one of the most amazing things that, you know, I'm looking forward to kind of doing back in the future is being able to look back at all of these wonderful, um, I wouldn't say wonderful photographs that I've taken because I hate them all, but like, <laughs> the wonderful moments that I've been able to witness, you know, like I've been able to see and witness some of the most rare animals on earth that likely, you know, I mean, functionally are extinct already and likely will be extinct in our, you know, kind of lifetimes, you know, those moments that will never happen again. you like, I've been able to yeah. witness them and hold on to it. And um, I think that the other thing that is a huge positive um, for me, especially, is knowing that you've made some kind of difference. You know, nowadays, which is great and really kind of uh, positive, is that you know everyone's kind of um, thinking more about how they can reduce their impact on Earth, uh, reduce their impact on our kind of resources. You know, in any kind of way possible, and. you know we're all kind of we all try it and we're all imperfect at it and that's fine you know you just have to do what you can as much as you can you can never fully achieve success um the one thing that i've been able to do which i'm just super proud of and you know makes me really happy is that i've been able to make an impact say on uh, shark conservation you know which oh, is okay. one of the very cool I've, like i've done a lot of work with sharks and to be able to photograph and raise awareness and affect a change through petitions through raising money through you know um I started a shark uh, foundation in Indonesia and we managed to create a shark sanctuary so to be able to kind of affect a, an actual tangible change in a, a life of a species is absolutely everything um and i guess the kind of the third thing is is to make the contacts and have those kind of shared experiences with friends um nothing better than making friends and creating things with them you know so to be able to do that all together with you know amazing wildlife and amazing kind of nature is is absolutely everything awesome on the uh, on the flip side of that what would be some of the uh, the less favorable or negative aspects you've um, you found in the industry um <clears throat> negative aspects in the industry i think um it's difficult because you kind of like any time you see these kind of negative things or you get annoyed about things i think you kind of largely just have to um skirt around them then with your own existence with your own kind of career you just kind of leave those things alone you know um i think like i, I said the one kind of last thing is the thing that annoys me the most is um not when you see people who don't kind of foster uh, a community of photographers or community of creatives themselves you know so people who you know when i see them and they don't follow anyone on instagram and it's like it just really bums me because they could really help people and really you know like foster a sense of community at, which is then going to help the you know next generation not just the next generation of photographers but those photographers could make a difference within our world and maybe those photographers just need that mentorship that extra boost that help that whatever that you know a follow a conversation or something like that does so for me i feel that that kind of um um 
uh, kind of cliqueishness in the photographic industry, I, I think, is um, is is very negative. But um, largely, I just kind of skirt around that. You know, when I see those kind of things in the industry, I just leave them alone and uh, go and do my do do my own kind of thing. Really, um, one thing it, it's very different, but the uh, kind of other negative thing that I do see. Um, which is a double-edged sword and so difficult to kind of square really because with uh, photography, especially the kind of the effects of Instagram, um, people will see cool things and cool pictures and then they want to go and do that, Mm. which in a sense is absolutely fine and natural and normal. And it's a good thing because some of the communities um, that we work with, say for instance, um, we just uh, did a big project with African Parks Network in Africa. You know, we just were trying to raise money for uh, the rangers because of COVID, the national parks aren't getting um, any tourists. So they need money to survive so that they don't flip over into poaching activities. Um, the problem is, is when you get then too many tourists and you get a kind of irresponsible tourism just to create those images then it really has a kind of negative impact on the um, the landscape around that area. Um, too much tourism is a kind of negative thing, and it and it kind of ruins places in a sense. So it's really difficult to kind of walk that road of yeah, you want to foster um, a kind of a good idea of tourism and people going to these places, but at the same time, not too much that ruin them. You know, it's definitely uh, a balancing act, isn't it? balancing act yeah and so I think that, that's probably the only other kind of like negative thing that I can I don't know I'm a pretty positive person so <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, we like to talk a little bit about uh, what people could expect salary wise in the industry now we did some research um, and came up with some figures and it seemed to range from anywhere between 18 up to 30,000 pound with the average figures for somebody to be able to earn does that sit right with your experiences and people within the industry that you know oh i i mean i think the thing is with <clears throat> within all creative industries your salary or your kind of income is you, it's just be beyond you know uh flexible but the range is just incredibly different it's you know i know people who you know are, are earning um multiple uh seven figure salaries um but then some people who you know are some of the best photographers or the best kind of creatives who you know largely don't make a living from it um it's so it's almost impossible to nail down a kind of a figure with it and the and the other reason why i think that is the case is because things change so quickly you know um uh, especially with the kind of rise of instagram and the kind of content creator influencer um thing that's happening with kind of corona at the moment you know like a lot of people will be going away to um places destinations locations to go and photograph them and then advertise them on their own instagram um space um people will do this for free because they get to go and create a body of work themselves take some nice pictures just go and have a nice holiday you know so it's like a lot of places will just expect that to happen for free. And then a lot of places will say, you know, okay, well, look, we want this specific person to do it. And they'll then pay for that person to do it. Sometimes they'll pay a nominal fee. Sometimes they'll pay in, you know, um, equipment. If they're like a, a brand, uh, sometimes they'll pay, you know, kind of big bucks for it. it. It really, really depends. And I think it's so difficult to, to nail down a kind of an actual um, an actual figure for it. One thing I would say is it's it's very difficult to maintain a a constant uh, salary with it. Um, if you're kind of looking into wildlife or nature photography as a fully paid career, then I think probably the main things to do is um, you know there's a degree in uh, Bristol um, to go and do for wildlife filmmaking. Um, which then allows you to step into the kind of um, 
the regulated industry, you know, of the BBCs, the production companies that make, you know, and, and kind of create wildlife films and so on, which are going to give you a much more kind of uh, regular uh, income and idea. Um, so, yeah, it's it's so di- so difficult to kind yeah. of to, to, to create it. You know, certainly the, certainly the highest paid or, or the higher paid jobs that I have are for brands that want to advertise their products in adventurous situations okay uh, so yeah i think most of the time it <clears throat> it depends on what you're photographing and you know what the monetary value of that picture is to an advertiser you know um so yeah what would be something that's uh that's not in the job description that you didn't realize you'd be dealing with every now and then hmm I just think, you know, as I've kind of grown up and grown into a photographic career, because I've done so many different types of careers and jobs before that, I shouldn't say careers, but jobs before that, I've really been able to kind of gain a lot of skills from that. Um, Priorities, you know, a kind of a prioritization list that, you know, that you get from uh, being a journalist, say, you know, nothing matters but the story. I think that's a really um, important kind of skill that I didn't really think about before. I, I don't know, actually, I think all, all of the kind of, all of the skills that you need to within this kind of industry generally are all kind of expected. I think the one thing that um, is less known about is just the business um, admin side of things you know you you do have to be kind of a little bit shrewd in terms of you know um, accounting and economy in order to try and make things kind of work and survive uh, and that also kind of goes for equipment you know we're constantly you know new cameras are coming out you're constantly working needing new equipment so you're looking to you know buy things offload things so being able to kind of sell you know, and move forward with your, you know, um, equipment is, is a, is a major thing. I think actually I've got a friend who works in tactical procurement, which sounds like a pretty interesting job, but, um, sounds you know, like he's some in the army or something. Tactical yeah, procurement. Yeah, yeah. 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 But, uh, I think he just did, did a lot of work for Coke before, but, but tactical procurement is just basically sourcing the right equipment for the right price and then looking towards the future of that piece of equipment um, or that, you know, uh, resource and then working out, you know, what the best thing is to do. And I think being careful about how you do that is probably one of the most important things to do because it's so important to keep yourself, um, you know, ahead of the game um, without breaking the bank. Yeah, I think that, that, well, that, would, that those two would be the kind of uh, the things that I think are the kind of less known about. And how would you, uh, if you were giving advice to someone about progressing in the industry, what kind of things would you say to them? For example, your Instagram, I'm sure, has uh, has given you opportunities and, and helped your career. Is there any other things you could do? Um, yeah, I mean, I kind of guess, I, aside from the, the stuff that, I think that the, the main thing is, is collaboration. It, once you build up a, a base of contacts, now, whether that is the contacts in the industry which do the same job as you, or whether that's contact in the industry of the people who want to employ you, it's all about contacts. Generally, if you work with people who do the same job as you in photography, you're, you're going to move forward. You know, They're going to invite you on trips. You're going to invite them on trips. You're going to share knowledge. You're going to get to be friends, and you're going to not only share knowledge about, um, you know, jobs, about potential employers, about um, potential uh, picture opportunities, but you're also going to share stuff about equipment, you know, creative ideas, trends, styles, everything like that. So I think those are the kind of the the main things really to do is to build up a a level of contact um, with people and collaborate with people. I think that's the, the most important thing. Uh, and, 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 and again, tenacity. You have to just be ten- tenacious and believe that you can do it. You might be believing you can do it and it might end up failing, but at least you, you know, had fun along the way. Yeah. You know? 
Um, but uh, it's what's, really- what's a good way to build up that network? Do you use um? Well, what sort yeah. of pla- do you use any platforms specifically? Yeah, I think like um, you know, certainly with social media, um, I think there's a way to go around that. You know, you see a lot of people are just kind of writing on accounts. You know, oh, please like and follow, please like and follow, and no one's going to pay attention to that because you're not offering something out you know the whole thing about social media is it's a especially in the kind of creative industries it's a global conversation about creativity about cool stuff you know so if you just kind of set yourself as a personality on in the kind of online space so you know commenting you know if you like something talk about it with the photographer, you know, like they will always respond because they want to respond because it boosts algorithms and so on like that. So let's say for instance, you know, you have a favorite photographer and you like their work for a certain reason, or, you know, it's interesting for a certain reason. Talk to them about it. You can send them a message, you know, like the worst thing they can do is ignore you, you know, um, send them a message, write them a comment, you know, people appreciate that because, it's talking about the kind of creative process and the work that's happening. And more often than and more often than not, you'll find that once you start to build up that relationship over months, weeks, years, whatever, you know, with those specific people, you know, you're firstly going to start to kind of create that kind of work anyway, because you're following that path, but they're also going to start to get interested in your work as well. You know, like, I think a lot of people see social media as just, what can I get? What can I get? Whereas if you look at all of the content creators out there, actually largely what they're doing is they're giving things away for free. You know, nothing's watermarked. We're just putting our work out there and we're sharing cool stuff. So yeah. if you just appreciate that, okay, um, social media is a platform for sharing things instead of just taking things you're going to you're going to kind of move forward awesome um would you still go into the industry knowing everything you know now uh yeah definitely i wish you know like it's so interesting seeing some of the some of the really amazing content creators that you know i kind of do stuff with now because you know like emmett emmett like you know my my career is my photographic career is as old as Emmett. <laughs> it's, so interesting. it's so interesting to see, you know, I was working on film back in the day and, you know, and these guys are picking up film cameras now. It's just so interesting to see. So yeah, definitely. You know, I, I, I wish, uh, well, I don't wish I was, you know, kind of younger like that, but if, you know, it would be, if I was in the industry now and just starting out, what a great time to be in the industry. You know, you've got new cameras, you've got new ideas. I think, Things have moved moved so quickly forward in the industry in the last kind of five years um, with the advent of um, new cameras and also social media that I think it's a fantastic time to get into the industry. And uh, and I think in the next kind of, in the next 10 years, things are going to kind of, I certainly think, I think that, you know, now things are starting to slow down a bit with this huge kind of Instagram revolution um but i think you know only the next thing is going to come along you know um new things are going to happen so i I think you know just imagine what's going to happen in 40 50 years with image making it's going to be absolutely incredible Mm. the future the future is bright yeah definitely well thank you so much for coming on steve it's been a real pleasure to talk to you and um, find out all about your career absolutely no problem at all it's been uh yeah it's been great thanks very much (laughs) thank you so much where can people find you on uh, on social media yeah, so um, you know, uh, I think the kind of main thing is in is Instagram. Really, um, uh, my Instagram is just Steve Woods. Sorry, Steve underscore Woods underscore photography. Um, if you just type in Steve Woods, generally it kind of will pop up. Um, and uh, you know, websites and so on is just Steve Woods Photography. So um, yeah, be lovely to see you uh, see you all online. Brilliant! Thank you so much for coming on. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, guys. Bye.